All right, so good morning. I'm Matt Smigo. I'm the immediate past president of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources Alumni Association. And I'll also be your host today for the, <clears throat> excuse me, for today's Farmland Society induction and our presentation. Uh, as many of you may know, I'm a graduate of the college with a degree in agri-science. And I'm also the director of the Public Policy and Commodity Division of Michigan Farm Bureau. On behalf of the College of Ag and Natural Resources, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. We have a lot in the store for you. We will celebrate our new farmland inductees. We'll also recognize those who are attending uh, their first farmland society event. We'll hear presentations from five areas of the college. And we'll also have the opportunity to network in small breakout rooms uh, with our presenters and as well as some of the fellow members today. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ron Hendrick, Dean of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. He's in his fifth year as the Dean of the college. Dr. Hendrick is a College of Ag and Natural Resources graduate, earning degrees in forestry and forest ecology. Please help me welcome Dean Ron Hendrick. Well, thank you, Matt, and good morning, everyone. It's great to have so many people on the call. You know, one year ago at this event, talk certainly of the coronavirus was swirling a little bit, but little did I know at that time that last year's ANR awards and Farm Lane Society event was going to be the last one of note that I would attend in person, um, including through today. And I'd much rather be with you in person today. But if we've learned anything over the last year, I think it's that it's um, it's important we connect regardless of the, the method. So again, thanks for joining us uh, at this virtual event today. The COVID-19 pandemic I know has impacted all of us in ways we wouldn't have imagined, and that's certainly been true here at MSU. When we were instructed to work from home and to move programs online last March, many of us suspected that we might be looking at an extended time frame, but perhaps not quite as long as it's turned out. We moved really quickly and we moved as much as we could last spring. Our classes, meetings, exams, extension programs, research field of days, social events, and even our commencements online. We also have had to make some tough decisions because of the virus this year. And pausing the dairy store operations may have been one of the most public. But we look forward to bringing that and other things back online when it's safe to do so. And when it's economically do so in the case of operations like the dairy store. We've learned a lot of new, a lot of new terms this year, things like Zoom fatigue, and we've pivoted to pretty much online everything. And we've said, or in my case, you've heard maybe hundreds of times phrases like, you're muted. We've not done everything perfectly, of course, over this last year, but we've kept the health and the safety of the people in the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources and our stakeholders as our top priority. And I think that's served us well. Make no mistake though, this has been a very challenging year for us as I know it's been for all of you. When the slowdowns and the move to online and remote work started last March, we still had a growing season to get going for our field research and our other activities. There are animals to be fed and research that needed to continue. And much of that occurred at our outstate research centers. As you know, Michigan's agricultural industry relies on a lot of the research we do here in this college. And we led the way at the university in establishing protocols, to keep progress going at our research centers and on our South Campus farms and in our laboratories. MSU Extension was significantly impacted. As you know, it's home to more than 170,000 Michigan youth and 4-H, and more than 13,000 volunteers work with those young people. And our folks have done a remarkable job moving things online to keep everyone as safe as possible. In addition to the many youth programs that we've made available online, our engagement through MSU Extension with Michigan's, res with Michigan's residents has meant a shift from a lot of in-person to online communication. But we've seen tremendous increases in participation in our web traffic. We've moved a lot of programming virtually and we've seen increased engagement because of that. And as we move back to our more traditional ways of working and doing things, uh, this will become a way that we continue to, to deliver some of the things that we do. While our lives have changed significantly because of COVID-19 and many of us are awaiting, maybe all of us a return to normal, 
we do wonder what, you know, from this new world we can keep and what shouldn't we keep. The increased engagement, the ability to meet people physically where they are and when they want, being able to approach each other with intentionality and kindness and grace. These are aspects that have been easy to assess and see and things that we need to keep. There are, of course, questions we're asking in our college of each other and our faculty and our staff and our students. Today, though, we've got an opportunity to say thank you for the support you have offered us in so many ways and to help you learn more about us in meaningful ways. And you'll hear that from our presenters this morning. Welcome again to the event and thanks the, uh, uh, for all of the things that you do for us. Thank you, uh, Dean Hendrick, for those comments. We appreciate you uh, being with us today. Um, now I'd like to transition to our, the reason that we're here, the Farm Lane Society, uh, which was created in 2016. The mission of the Farm Lane Society is to honor individuals who have demonstrated a commitment to Michigan State University's College of Agriculture and Natural Resources and fostering continuing involvement with both the college and its alumni association. Membership is granted to alumni who have served in an appointed position on the CNR Alumni Association Board of Directors or who have received a CNR Alumni Association Award or a Distinguished Service Award. Benefits of the society include special recognition of members with this pen, which you'll see on your screen. We also highlight an annual event during ANR month on campus. We provide behind the scenes tours of campus locations, similar to what we did last year for those of you that were able to join us. We also provide special periodic programming on MSU properties and research centers. So more of that inside look. Since our inaugural event in six, uh, six years ago, we have penned over 222 people into this group. The majority of which have been right on campus, uh, but smaller groups and individual events have been held in Washington, DC, Southern Florida, and even on a pier in the Pacific Ocean and in Southern California. So as you know, Farm Lane is our main thoroughfare uh, north and south through campus. And it reminds us of our history as the original land grant institution. For our society, it represents the continuum of those that came before us and their accomplishments, it also represents a great foundation for the future generations to continue to build our legacy. So today we have the privilege, we'll be pinning 12 members. Um, and since we cannot stand together today at a podium, uh, I would ask that when we recognize your name, uh, if you're available to turn on your video and uh, give a wave so that we can uh, see you here uh, this morning. So first up, uh, we'd like to recognize Troy Bancroft. Uh, Troy was the Honorary Alumnus Award recipient in 2020. Next, we have George Bird, a Distinguished Faculty Award recipient, also in 2020. Susan Chamberlain uh, served on the Alumni Board from 2016 to 2020. I had the privilege of serving alongside of Sue, so congratulations. Uh, Dirk Drost uh, was the Outstanding Alumnus Award recipient also in 2020. Frank Edwagishik, a uh, Distinguished Award recipient in 2020. Edwin Chip Foster, Outstanding Alumnus Award recipient in 2017. One of our speakers today, Mary Hausbeck, Distinguished Faculty Award recipient in 2006. Another one of our speakers, Deb McCullough, Distinguished Faculty Award recipient in 2016. Trevor Meacham, our Distinguished Service Award recipient in 2020. John Oakley served on the Alumni Board from 1990 to 1993. James Ribbon served on the Alumni Board from 2000 to 2001. Mark Shep, Shepardigian, served on the Alumni Board from 2014 to 2019. And finally, Truman Sherbrooke, Distinguished Faculty Award recipient in 2020. 
we're delighted that you've chosen to become an active member of the Farm Lane Society. This year, um, we'd like to uh, recognize you in, in becoming a, a recipient within that uh, distinguished group. So from your spots, you can give them a round of applause and congratulate them and welcome them into the Farm Lane Society. In addition to that, uh, we would like to recognize uh, several of the Farm Lane Society members that we lost this past year. And we'd like to take a moment of remembrance uh, for those members whose passing has been reported to the university again this past year. Uh, first is James Anderson, who received the Honorary Alumnus Award in 1980 and served on the Alumni Board from 1986 to 1989. Jack Bales received the Distinguished Service Award in 1990 and served on the Alumni Board from 1975 to 1979. Frank Corn served on the Alumni Board in 1983 to 1984. Fred Henningsen served on the Alumni Board from 1976 to 1980. Richard Kraft Jr. served the Distinguished, served, uh, or excuse me, received the Distinguished Service Award in 1992. Martha Miller received the Distinguished Service Award in 2000. Finally, Lawrence Stebbins received the alum, or was served on the Alumni Board uh, from 1982 to 1983. So if you would, please pause with me for a moment of silence. Thank you. Today, we have an excellent lineup of experts to share an update with us on their work and the work of their partners. And first, I'd like to start with introduction of Christy Poitra. Uh, Christy is the interim director of the MSU Native American Institute. Dr. Poitra is the Turtle Mountain Chippewa with family ties to Little Shell. She is an alumna of the UC Berkeley, UCLA, and Michigan State University. Dr. Poitra is an affiliate faculty member in the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program and a core faculty and gender center for global context. She's an elected member of the Faculty Senate, University Council, and the University Curriculum Committee. She also serves on the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, AISES Education Committee, and is an AISES Advancing Agricultural Science Opportunities for a Native Americans mentor. Dr. Poitra is the recipient of the Distinguished Community Partnership Award and Excellence in Diversity Award. She has held several prestigious fellowships, including the Michigan Educational Policy Fellowship Program, the New Sector Alliance Fellowship and Academic Advancement Network Leadership Development. Um, prior to NAI, Dr. Poitra was appointed for several years in the MSU Office of K-12 Outreach, where she worked on issues of instructional leadership in diverse school context, she also served as a consultant for the Los Angeles Unified School District and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Poitra. I am so excited to spend some time with you all and share a little bit about land acknowledgements um, and the work in NEI. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so how I think of land acknowledgements is it's really a statement that honors and recognizes and affirms indigenous histories within a territory um, within the context of MSU, uh, land acknowledgements, I think, are deeply tied um, to our land grant institution mission. <clears throat> With that said, I'm going to give the land acknowledgement. Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe people, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi people. The university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. I believe that the land acknowledgement relates to the work of NAI in sort of affirming and furthering the land grant mission of this institution. Next slide, please. So often I get asked what NAI does. Um, so this year marks the 40th anniversary of the Institute. Um, it was founded in 1981 by Professor George Cornell. Um, in 2003, NAI joined the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Our mission is really focused on supporting community goals and outcomes. We also work closely with campus partners and community partners. Next slide, please. So our areas of focus are community collaborations, um, endowments and student loan funds, 
um, campus programming and applied research. Next slide. Um, so I want to give an example of one of our community project collaborations. Um, Gitagan is an Anishinaabe garden in the greater Lansing area. Um, we have had the opportunity to work very closely on several gardening events. Um, Gitagan focuses on growing traditional food with heirloom seeds gifted from other communities. Um, this year marks, I believe, the second anniversary of the garden. Um, and as you can see, there's some pictures of small corns, which are adorable. Um, and so we continue to work with Gitagon as we try to um, further develop our, our gardening initiatives by developing greenhouses um, and things of that nature. Next slide. Um, the office also administers two endowments. The first one is the John R. Winchester Endowment Fund, which was established in 2001. Um, it focuses on really supporting Native students um, who have met some challenges during their education journey. Um, and the focus is really to support them um, in completing their degree. Uh, the Emma Shore Thornton Endowment is focused on honoring Native students that are high achievers that are very focused on working with Native communities after graduation. And finally, we also administer the Winchester Emergency Loan Fund. The fund itself provides small short-term loans for undergraduate and graduate students, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically for them to have funds to make transitions. So purchasing textbooks, um, helping with uh, transitions to new apartments, things like that. Next slide, please. So this is an example of campus programming. Uh, this was our Black Ash Basket workshop in 2019, um, November of 2019. What we did was we brought in um, a well-known um, Odawa artist. She um, discussed her traditional harvesting practices of how she takes um, the black ash um, materials from a log all the way to the um, uh, pieces that you can weave with. Um, she talked about uh, the impacts of invasive species on black ash trees throughout Michigan. Um, and she also sort of talked through um, the process and how to weave. So attendees were invited uh, to weave a basket of their own. And as you can see in the picture, this is one of our attendees um, working with one of the support staff to sort of figure out how to um, weave the handle on her basket. Next slide, please. And finally, um, I am a firm believer of applied research, which means research with practical applications within tribal communities and also within the academy. So this is a workbook that NAI put out last year, honoring the whole student. And the focus really was how can we develop a resource um, that helps faculty and staff be better mentors to their native students. And so the workbook features an array of exercises and reflection activities in which someone can think about critically how they can better mentor these students through their education journeys. Next slide, please. So that's just a little taste of what NAI does. I look forward to talking with all of you in the breakout rooms. Miigwech and have a wonderful day. Christy, thank you for this information. Uh, the historical context of the land agreement is very important for all of us to know and understand. So thank you again. Our next speaker is Deb McCullough. Uh, Deb holds graduate degrees in forestry with a master's of science from Northern Arizona University and entomology with a PhD from the University of Minnesota. She's a professor with a joint appointment in the Department of Entomology in the Department of Forestry at Michigan State University with research and extension and teaching responsibilities. Deb's research focuses on the ecology, impacts, and management of native and invasive forest insects, including the emerald ash borer, beech bark disease, and hemlock woolly adelgid. She works with forest managers, regulatory officials, arborists, and landowners to develop sustainable management strategies to protect forest health. McCullough has published more than 120 papers about forestry, uh, forest insect ecology and management in scientific journals, and roughly 250 non-peer-reviewed articles and extension bulletins. She's a member of the National Forest Research Advisory Committee to USDA, the Science Advisory Board of American Forests, and the Michigan Forest Invasive Species Committee. Please help me welcome Deb. Deb, can 
Hey, hey, hello everyone. It's really good to be with you today and uh, we get to talk a little bit about invasive forest insects. Hopefully you have not encountered too many of those yet, uh, but if you haven't, there's a very good chance that one or more of these is coming your way soon. So uh, next slide, please. I think we should take a, a few seconds and think about how fortunate we are to have the amazing forest resource in Michigan where we live. Uh, we are number one in the Northeast. Out of 23 Northeastern states, we have the most forest area. 56% of the land base in Michigan is forested. That's a little bit over 20 million acres. And it's incredibly diverse. Everything from wetland forests, oak hickory, beautiful northern hardwood stands, uh, even boreal forest species like jack pine make it down into Michigan. And of course, these forests provide habitat for all kinds of wildlife, many, many different types of recreational opportunities and the corresponding economic impacts of that recreation, as well as forest products, which uh, contributes over $20 million a year to the state. Uh, next slide, please. But one of the uh, traits that goes along with this extensive and diverse forest resource is that if a non-native insect is introduced into Michigan, there's a very good chance that it will find a tree that it can colonize and feed on. And one of the other distinguishing features of Michigan is that we are a major manufacturing hub. And so you think about auto plants and furniture production and all the things that are manufactured in Michigan and many of those industries import commodities from overseas. And it is most common for those commodities to arrive with solid wood packing material, crates, pallets and so forth. And that material is a really good way to introduce new wood boring insects, bark beetles, other kinds of beetles, even tree diseases. Uh, we also have a major plant industry here. And while uh, these, these nurseries are not importing stock from overseas much anymore, they certainly bring in small trees from other states, which is another way to introduce uh, insects into Michigan and the never ending uh, outreach opportunity to try to get people not to move firewood long distances because fresh firewood uh, can introduce some of these same wood borers. Next slide, please. Uh, if you look at this, it's a really interesting map. It, this is the major damaging forest insects plotted by county. And you can see the Northeast portion of the country lights up and Michigan is kind of that deep pink color, and if anything, it's actually gotten closer to the purple color. Of the 58 species of damaging high impact invasive forest insects known to be in the continental US, we have at least 39 of them. Uh, next slide, please. And the poster child for these invasive forest pests has got to be emerald ash borer, our very own emerald ash borer. It became established in North America in the greater Detroit area in Southeast Michigan. It was discovered in 2002, but we did a big old tree ring study and we know it was here by the early 90s and killing trees by 1996 or so. Uh, it has more recently become an international problem. It invaded Moscow, Russia. It continues to spread to the West. It now threatens ash in Europe. Uh, in 2017, the entire genus of ash, Fraxinus, was redlisted by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And that is not a list you want to be on. That, those are species at peril. Um, at least some species, particularly black ash is the one I'm really concerned about, could actually uh, face extirpation. Uh, we now have ash borer in 35 states, five Canadian provinces, and uh, it will almost assuredly continue to spread. Next slide. Uh, we also have hemlock woolly adelgid, another tree killing invasive pest. It's over in little spots of infestation along Lake Michigan, but five counties now going from Allegan up to Mason County. Uh, we don't want our hemlocks to look like hemlocks do in New England and Appalachia and some of those areas. Next slide. And we have beech bark disease. It's been here for more than 25 years. It's an invasive insect and an invasive pathogen and big beech trees are most vulnerable. We've lost about 75% of the big beech in the UP and that's working its way down from Northwest Lower Michigan now. Next slide, please. 
Uh, there's other insects that we don't want to get into Michigan. We don't have them and we don't want them. Asian longhorn beetle, we're always on the lookout for that. You can see what it will do to uh, a maple tree. Spotted lanternfly is another, uh, not a tree killer, but certainly an icky insect. Next slide, please. And uh, Ron mentioned uh, last year, about a year ago, <laughs> campus closed, everything was shut down. Uh, we weren't sure what we were going to do, what was going to happen to grants. We have grad students and uh, technicians that need to be paid, but if no work gets done, you're spending the grant money but not getting anything out of it. Uh, next slide. One of the things that was really helpful was, as Ron mentioned, this uh, ability to continue our field work last summer. The essential research and travel permits that uh, the process that was developed by the administrators in the college really made things um, work for us, let's say. Uh, we lost some, some ability to um, get stuff done, but for the most part, we're carrying on. Next slide. We have work going on with black ash, looking at post-invasion conditions, hemlocks and hemlock adelgid. Next slide. Uh, we do a big statewide survey to try to detect any new populations of exotic wood borers that we're not aware of yet. And we're even doing a little bit with chestnut production and chestnut weevils. So next slide. Um, I think we can all agree with this. 2021's gotta be a better year than 2020, but um, you know, it's, it's gonna get better and better. So thank you and I will stop there. Thank you, Dr. McCullough. Um, not only our industry, but I think all the people of Michigan are very lucky to have you working on these emerging issues. So thank you again. Um, our next presentation is from Patrick Cudney. Uh, many of you know, may know that with Dr. Jeff Dwyer stepping down from MSU Extension for sabbatical, the transition that actually just happened this week, uh, Patrick Cudney is now the acting director of MSU Extension. He will serve in this role until May when Dr. Quentin Tyler becomes the interim director. Uh, Cudney serves as the Associate Director for MSU Extension and has since uh, September 2014. Uh, he began his MSU Extension career in 1996 as a 4-H youth agent, and he quickly moved up the ranks to become, at age 27, the youngest County Extension Director in the state. Three years later, he was appointed as the Regional Director of the MSU Extension North Region and worked in that role until accepting the Associate Director role. Mr. Cudney puts his extensive years of extension and outreach experience to work to help foster collaborations committed to serving the needs of Michigan's individuals, families, businesses, and communities. Please help me welcome Patrick. Matt, thank you so much. And, and I can't believe actually it's been close to 25 years since I started with extension. Um, first, let me offer a heartfelt congratulations to both the new and existing members of the Farm Lane Society. And thank you to our alumni, our faculty, and our staff who are joining us on this Zoom today. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you a bit about the good work my colleagues have been doing in MSU Extension. Um, as Matt said, my name is Patrick Cudney and I've been the acting director for Extension for all of five days. And when I took over for Jeff uh, as he began his long overdue sabbatical. Um, and I'll be in this role for just a few months. Uh, and then I go back to having just one job again. And that, as Matt said, when Dr. Quinton Tyler becomes our interim director on May 1st for MSU Extension, and he'll remain in that role until a national search is conducted and a new director of Extension is identified. These are certainly challenging and exciting times at the university and within Extension. Um, they've not been the easiest of times. Deb, I got a big chuckle out of your COVID slide and, and thought I might borrow some of your graphics. Um, as you know, we have uh, over 600 faculty and staff that are distributed across the state of Michigan. And our faculty and staff live and work in all 83 counties in Michigan, where they conduct educational programming in communities for families, businesses, and with farmers. And with a few exceptions here and there, none of them have seen the inside of their offices for almost a year at this point. Though the COVID-19 pandemic sent us all to our homes, it didn't send us home to rest. Instead, our teams uh, creatively used it as an opportunity to think differently about the way we deliver our research and evidence-based content and did so in new and creative ways. Um, being that agriculture and natural resource had an essential industry designation in the state of Michigan, 
we've been managing, as Deb had acknowledged, uh, the, the travel needs of our staff to make sure that we are being responsive to our commodity partners and to those industries that needed face-to-face -face support. And the vast majority of our staff and other institutes worked very hard at creating virtual opportunities in a very rapid time. In fact, within six days of the initial stay home, stay safe executive order, we launched the remote learning and resources website. And our teams began modifying programming to interact to virtual formats to provide equal educational value in people's homes in ways that we would have done face-to-face -face prior. This online space is robust, virtual one-stop shopping for everything MSU Extension has to offer online. And it houses educational resources related to parenting and helping parents keep children on track with learning as they were doing education and school at home. An extensive list of online programming for adults, a calendar of virtual events, certainly a number of videos and YouTube videos and relevant responsive evidence-based articles that were authored by our vast network of extension educators. Resources for local governments and communities in navigating the, effect of the effects of the pandemic and more. And our website traffic. We enjoy a very robust, always a robust web presence. And we had over 800,000 visitors a month prior to the pandemic. After the pandemic began, that visits spiked to over 1.4 million visitors a month coming to seek research and evidence-based content from our web-based resources. We're still seeing about 1.2 million visitors a month to our MSU Extension web presence because of that important educational content that people are seeking new ways to uh, tap into that content. And we were amazed at how quickly our staff could adjust and, and, and pivot to be responsive in this crisis. And that was really just the beginning. There's been an amazing amount of online resources, content, conferences being hosted virtually. We launched our MSU Extension Rapid Response for Agriculture website that provides a single point of access for farmers regarding personal protective equipment and other resources aimed at keeping staff and farmers, businesses, communities safe while meeting consumer demands for a fresh, safe, healthy food supply. Perhaps one of our more publicized projects you heard about was our Food Processing and Innovation Center and the PPE and decontamination powerhouse it became. As you know, hospitals were overloaded and had an increased need for personal protective equipment. As the shortages loomed, the ability to reuse these materials became increasingly important. On April 1st last year, the Food Processing Innovation Center began using our Marlin spiral oven to decontaminate N95 masks for area hospitals. As summer rolled around, our Michigan 4-H Development Program professionals, because fairs across the state were having to make those difficult decisions to, uh, to be canceled and to not take place, our 4-H team responded very quickly by creating the Michigan 4-H Virtual Showcase and Auction. These online fair experiences allowed feedback and to be recognized for young people's many accomplishments. Um, their auction and still in static market animal projects and we're proud to report that over 58 county fairs used that virtual platform to complete nearly 10,000 projects. The Michigan State Fair also partnered with us and it generated over $1.4 million in the online auction platform for our 4-H community. That was a, a really important initiative and it will continue this year as fairs struggle with the ability to be face-to-face -face or not. No one more than me and our staff look forward to participating face-to-face. -face. Uh, more recently, we rolled out the Michigan 4-H guidance for working with fair partners in 2021. And as we can start returning in a staged, systemed approach to re-engaging in face-to-face -face audiences, we'll continue to support these online learning platforms while we move back into face-to-face -face programming as conditions allow. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. And I look forward to our roundtable discussions. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Patrick, for the update. And we appreciate the information and we look forward to sharing that with our networks. So next up uh, on our agenda is Mary Hausbeck. Uh, Mary is a university distinguished professor in the Department of Plant and Microbial and Soil Sciences. Her work reflects Michigan's diversity and currently includes asparagus, snap beans, broccoli, carrots, celery, 
cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, and squash, uh, onions, peppers, tomatoes, greenhouse vegetable transplants, ginseng, and hop. Uh, she's also involved in floriculture crops with an emphasis on poinsettia, geranium, cut flowers, bedding plants, and herbaceous potted plants. She and her laboratory are involved in a wide variety of research projects, reflective of our broad commodity portfolio, with her overall goal uh, to reduce Michigan's grower reliance on fungicides through novel and integrated management strategies and enhanced knowledge of pathogen etiology and epidemiology. So with that, Dr. Hausbeck. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. I am a Spartan through and through. Um, geez, met my husband on the campus of MSU as an undergraduate. Um, between Greg and I and our three kids, we hold eight degrees from MSU. So um, it's just no wonder that I give MSU so much credit for, for everything that um, I'm able to do and, and what our family is able to do. Today, we're going to talk about a partnership to protect Michigan's cucumber industry. Um, the very first job of my life was sorting cucumbers. And here I am many, many years later, still working on cucumbers. And so Michigan ranks number one in the nation for production of cucumbers for pickling. And the number one problem today is a disease that I'll refer to as downy mildew which the growers estimate cause them 6.4 million annually. And that is not only yield loss, but that's increased cost of protection. It's the um, equipment expenses needed to apply fungicides. It's the pivoting that they have had to do in a major way to reduce the risk that downy mildew has brought to this industry. Next slide. And so I wanna take a minute and take a look at these symptoms. And if you are growing cucumbers in your home garden, it is very, very likely that you have seen a, something similar to this, which is a leaf blighting. And what it starts as what I call a window pane effect, where you have this yellowing chlorosis, which turns brown and it's bordered by the leaf veins. And so it gives a bit of a square appearance to it. And then you can see um, what some folks call is like, geez, my leaf looks a little dirty. And actually that, that mold, which is dark, gives that leaf a dirty appearance. And it's actually the reproductive spores of the pathogen that you're seeing in, in large masses. And from the time that this disease begins, if it's left untreated within 10 days, you would have major death of the vines that is, that is pictured in the upper left-hand corner. And so let's go on to the next um, slide. So, you know, prior to 2005 in the state of Michigan, our commercial cucumber lines were resistant to downy mildew. It just wasn't a problem. In fact, um, cucumbers really did not need plant protectants in a major way at all. And then 2005 hit and oh my gosh, it was pandemonium as um, cucumbers that should have been resistant to this disease um, became highly infected by this pathogen and the disease swept across the state. I just cannot even begin to describe um, what that meant to our industry that year. Um, we were totally blindsided and you know we didn't know um, going into 2006, whether we would have this pathogen, you know, cause havoc again. This pathogen does not overwinter in the north or in any region where there is a frost. The airs, the um, spores are airborne. And so they have to essentially blow into our production areas during the growing season. You know, I mentioned that our resistant varieties um, had become highly diseased. And so our genetic resistance of the host crop was gone. And our best fungicides, even in 2005, were not working. And, you know, what has happened is that since 05, we have had downy mildew in our major cucumber production regions um, in the U.S., especially east of the Mississippi, each year. And each year, it seems 
that we have major changes in the fungicides as far as which are working and which are not. And it's, it's the change in the pathogen really keeping us on our toes. And so when, when you look at you know, these bullets, as I was putting this slide together, I'm like, wow, this, this, is, this was really hard. This was a very, a very difficult pathogen. We had all kinds of um, concerns about whether or not we were gonna be able to have a pickling cucumber industry in the state. And then like my final bullet really is that, um, you know, MSU plus growers equals success. All right, so next slide. And so we put together a disease warning system and we put spore traps in growers fields and we worked on new DNA based tools so we could detect the first spores that would arrive in Michigan fields so that growers then would be able to have an alert and time their fungicide programs. Next slide. This is an example of um, the systems that we have put forward in our major production areas. Um, I talked about the black mold that is on the leaf. It's in the lower um, left-hand corner. You see magnification of those airborne sporangia. And then in the, in the left-hand, um, the upper slide, the blue stain slide, you'll see what we see when we look at the tapes from the spore trap, which is that green UFO um, piece of equipment, that's what we take a look at and then identify. Initially, we identified them using only microscopy. In the, the next slide. In 2020, as Deb McCullough had mentioned, we really um, needed to scale back our, our research. However, we did, we did monitor five production regions that was down from our usual eight. And um, you can see the production regions in the thumb area and then along the west side of the state. And then the next slide. What I wanna point out is what we did in, in 2020, and perhaps COVID pushed us into this, we went from using microscopy to a new PCR-based tool in tandem to identify when our production regions have downy mildew um, flying into their state. We, we trimmed back, we were, we were not able to do the microscopy because we didn't have the student support due to COVID. And we went fully with the PCR molecular tool, which was a bit like stepping off the ledge for us because we've always used the two in tandem. However, we had very high success in using the PCR based tool only. We found it to be highly sensitive, accurate. It gave us a much quicker turnaround um, and so with this information, I have pictured here our website. Not only will we find yearly crop protection guidelines here, which do change each year, we have spore monitoring and state alerts. And we usually get um, more, almost 25,000 hits to this website in the months of June and July, as we anxiously await for the arrival of downy mildew into our state's production growing regions. Next slide. And so finally, I just wanted to wrap up that this really has been a team approach. I cannot overemphasize the partnership that we have had with the industry. Um, you'll see pictures of the growers coming to look at our field plots on campus. Um, the, the main picture that you see here is actually a large grower cooperator in Hemlock that allowed us to do the trials on their farm this year. Again, with COVID, we just didn't have the labor and other resources needed to put together our plots on campus. And so you'll see um, the spore trap and you see all the stakes of our field researcher um, directly in collaboration with a grower farm. And our various graduate students are pictured that have really helped us get this um, spore trapping um, mechanization so that we provide real time um, very highly sensitive information to our growers. Next slide. And then finally, you know, we always talk about our funding and this just simply shows how important this problem has been and how all these resources have been um, garnered to make sure that we can keep our cucumbers productive into the future. And with that, um, that concludes it for me. Thanks so much for your attention. 
Thank you, Dr. Hausbeck, for that uh, excellent presentation, as well as uh, the work that you do that protects our specialty crops in the state. We really appreciate that. So our final speaker today is Ajit Srivastav. Uh, you may know Ajit as an outstanding service to the college spans almost 40 years. Uh, includes educational innovations, significant scholarly contributions, and outstanding programmatic leadership. Srivastava is a former department chair of the Department of Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering. And uh, became, excuse me, engineering. And it was under his vision that the leadership uh, that the Ag Engineering Department became the Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering Department. He developed and led a bioenergy study abroad program to Sweden and Germany and launched the department's flagship event, the BE Showcase. So with that, uh, I would like to turn it over to Ajit. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts uh, today. Today, I wanna to talk about how we uh, prepare biosystems engineers to address society's needs. Uh, this is part of a course that I teach and uh, so I'll share with you some of the learning objectives. We essentially talk about what, what is uh, the profession of engineering and what role engineers play in shaping society. We also take time to understand uh, society's challenges and uh, how those challenges actually shape our profession and how do we address those challenges. So what is engineering? Engineering is a application of uh, mathematics, natural sciences to solve society's problems. Engineers design or create solutions. They design products, processes that benefit society. Engineers are inventors and there are many examples of uh, uh, engineers who have invented things that we take for granted today. We talk about what is society. Society is a group of people living together, agreeing to follow certain rules, regulations in a way that helps uh, the whole society. Society behaviors are influenced by culture, politics, economics, environment, and geography. Major events that have affected engineering have been for example, World War I and II, the Great Depression of the 30s, and things like Race to the Moon. They have all influenced engineering. Engineering in return have also facilitated a lot of uh, growth and development in this country, as you can see in the upper right-hand side, the building of the Erie Canal, so, so people can migrate to West, building of railroads, and, 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 and all of these developments actually made it possible for the uh, Homestead Act to become a reality in, 19, in 1862. Engineers have actually made a huge impact on changing the complex or complexion of this country from primarily agrarian society to a major uh, industrial manufacturing powerhouse that is today. And that was done through industrialization by developing methods and technologies to mass produce with quality products that society needs. Agriculture engineers have deployed similar uh, approaches to industrialize agriculture. As you can see, all of these developments and innovations in technologies have made agriculture a major industry in the US it is today. To a point that uh, National Academy of Engineers in the, for the 20th century have recognized agricultural mechanization as the seventh most significant engineering achievement of all times. So we are ahead of computers, telephone, air conditioning, aircraft, highways and so forth. So the impact of agriculture industrialization has been that uh, we have, as I said earlier, transformed US complexion. Back in the 1900s, 136 million people uh, were there in the, in the country, 70% of them lived on the farm. Today, we are 300 and 
uh, 35 plus and less than seven, less than 5% are engaged in direct agriculture. U.S. agriculture is a highly productive industry and exports more goods than any other sector of economy. Americans pay less than 5% of their disposable income on food, making it a very affordable and efficient uh, operation. We talk about um, global challenges in this course. Food security is a major challenge. As you can see, the dark color uh, where there is a serious uh, 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 food security issues. Green means there is not so much of a problem. So you can see, particularly in Africa, uh, Latin America, and Asian countries have uh, significant food security issues. Next, please. There is uh, a global uh, nutrition security issues also. Next slide, please. Water security, I will go rapidly through these. Uh, energy security, you can see the difference between haves and have nots are, are tremendous. Global warming is the issue that we talked about. Next, population growth. Next. Uh, rapid urbanization is a major issue that we have to address. So what that means is that uh, the, the diet of today's people is changing. We are consuming more protein that's putting a lot more pressure on production agriculture. Next time. So that means we have to essentially double our food production to meet the demand of uh, 2050. But we have limited water and energy uh, resources and we have to address food losses. So these are some of the strategies we talk about, how we can address those uh, challenges. Next slide. There is a process called engineering design process. We talk about what that process is. You identify a problem, take it down to conceptual design, preliminary design, detailed design, and implementation. Next is a, a basically an example of some of the projects that students do in the course as and working in team throughout. And, and they produce a pretty comprehensive report uh, looking at those issues. So I will say that the opportunities for biosystem engineers are boundless because these problems that I outlined will not end anytime soon. Thank you. Dr. Shravastov, thank you for the work that you do to make uh, sure that students leave MSU as problem solvers and they're ready to jump in and make a difference in any position or organization that they work for. Uh, as a side note, uh, the CEO of Michigan Farm Bureau is a graduate of this program. So uh, before we move forward, and I'd like to once again, thank all of our presenters this morning. And I would also like to extend a hearty congratulations for our newest inductees to the Farm Lane Society.